Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Faith Harvest Church. Hallelujah. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Faith Harvest Church. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I want to uh, just give you a scripture and a couple quotes. Um, Hebrews chapter 6, which pastor has been preaching on. Um, we're going to skip down a little bit. It says in verse 9, but beloved, we are confident of better things. Everybody say better things. Better things. Concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation that we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Which means if he... He's not unjust, which means if you've labored, he's seen it. He'll reward it. He's watching. If you worked at a natural job a whole week and they didn't pay you, is that just or unjust? It's unjust. So if you've been ministering and laboring for the Lord, he has, he's going to provide payment. Now, we know his payment is his blessing. It's his provision. It's his grace. Verse 11, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligent to the full assurance of hope until the end. And this is the verse I want you to get. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patient, patience inherit the promise of God. We'll read that again. That you would not become sluggish, but would imitate those through faith and patient inherit the promises of God. And I just wanted to leave you with this, that... There's a couple of things that I, I heard that I wrote down and it said uh, the purpose of I heard this. The purpose and plans of God don't have an expiration date. They have a fulfillment date. So it doesn't matter what your outlook's been. It doesn't matter what's been going on in your life. It doesn't matter if you feel like you failed or if you feel behind. Just know this. The promise isn't dead. That's right. The promise is alive as long as he's alive. Amen. Yes. Amen. And so it doesn't have an expiration date. It has your, a fulfillment date. Yes. And it says that by faith and patience, they inherited the promises of God. Can you say amen? amen. So go ahead and stand to your feet. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. So I, I believe it's time for us as a church to, to just let today, let the Lord just, if there's been promises, if there's been dreams, if there's been visions, if there's been passions that have almost seemed like they've dwindled, let the Lord just reinvigorate it this morning. Let the Lord just reignite it this morning. Let him restore the, the, the faith and the patience to inherit the promise because your promises aren't denied. Delayment doesn't mean delayment does not mean denial. OK, there is a place where you just you step in by faith. You say this is what we're going to have. You got to stand your ground. You got to rise up. As Pastor said, you just rise up in the spirit. You just don't take no for an answer. It's called possessing the land. When, when uh, God told Israel to possess the land to go take out the giants, he when in that word of possess the land, carried the grace to go drive out the giants. It wasn't that. He was going to drive the giants out. He gave them the grace to drive the giants out. And so he's given you faith that it's not over. The promise isn't dead. The promise is, everybody say the promise. The promise. Isn't dead. Isn't dead. It's alive. Amen. So who's ready to inherit some promises this morning? Lift your hands right now. Well, Father, we just thank you, Lord, this morning. Father, we thank you that you're a faithful God. Lord, we thank you that you are one who sees, you look, you know the very hearts of man. Lord, you said in your word, you'll hearken unto your word to perform it. You are fixed. You are bent. You are 100% devoted on your side. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that faith would arise. Lord, that faith would arise, Lord God, that there would be the promises, the dreams, the visions, the passions, the goals, the desires, Lord, today, Lord, would be reawakened and reawakened.
rekindled and reflamed this morning. Lord, that every promise that seems almost like a, a stillborn in the womb, Lord, that today you would just resurrect that promise. Lord, that you would resurrect that prophetic word by which they can wage a good warfare. Lord, that there would be just a release, Lord, of hunger and fire and glory today, that you would receive all the praise and all the glory and all the honor in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God. Lord, that it's not denied. It's not denied, Lord God. It's available. And so, Father, we thank you this morning for your people, Jesus, to take it, to take it by faith this morning and to just fix our eyes on you. You said in your word, you're the author and the finisher of our faith. So this morning, Jesus, we fix our eyes upon you, that you would receive all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, all of it, Jesus, that the promise is literally tied to you, that when we get you, we get everything. And so this morning, Holy Spirit, blow through this place, fulfill the purposes of heaven today in this place that the father's will would be that the father's desire would be unleashed today this morning so we thank you come on just give jesus a shout this morning just open up your mouth and just praise him just lift up the name of jesus this morning he's the object of your worship i'm telling you if you just look at and gaze at jesus everything's going to become clear everything the weights fall off the sins fall off the sluggishness falls off the the the, the hurt heals everything begins to just move because he's all sufficient one he's He's the all-sufficient one. He has everything that you need. So let's, so let's worship him this morning. Let's honor him this morning in the name of Jesus. What I think we hit the mark in the spirit of worship today. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. 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 Glory be to God. You know, we're shifting in in to another part of the service, but it's all still in the arena of the glory of God. Amen. Praise you, Lord Jesus. We're going to give you an opportunity to sow into the kingdom of God for his purpose. Amen. Lord, I mean, you know, every red cent that we sow is to his glory and to his purpose. Does anybody need, are you doing that um, offering? Cornelius, thank you. And thank you for that word, Michelle. Glory be to God. Deep things, deep things going on in the spirit today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. We welcome everyone. Praise God. And how many of you already have your faith out <clears throat> that you're going to leave here full? and overflowing in the Holy Ghost, because that's where it's at. That's where life is. Amen. As we were worshiping, um, I was reminded of a song. And by the way, thank you, worship team. That was awesome. Thank you. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. As we were worshiping, I was reminded of a song I listened to, and I believe that Alina and them have sang it before, but it's talking about carrying a heavy cross and or a weighty cross. And, you know, the burden that Jesus, and they sang about it, the burden that Jesus carried, right? Are y'all listening? Yeah. yeah. Well, that was a, a, a very big burden and a heavy weight. That he carried for us, but it was for so the so that we could carry the weight of his glory. It was a great exchange right there. We could never we fell short of the glory. Man fell short of that. But when he carried that cross, that weight, he exchanged it so we could carry the weight of the glory and you know come back into that place of a glory man and um, I was reminded how Moses said God I want to see I want to see your face I want to see your glory and God said you can't see my face if you see my face you will die he said I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and he did and he said but and he walked by and he said you can see my hinder parts but you cannot see me to my face but guess what 
We can read it in Romans. He had to put a veil over his face when he came down out of that mountain. He didn't see God face to face, but he was with God in that mountain. And he said, there's a more sure glory, and that is in Christ Jesus. And pastor's birthday scripture, it says, Nevertheless, when the veil is uh, taken away, the heart will turn to the Lord. The veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with what? Open face, no veil. Face to face. Face to face. Why? Because we're born of him who carries the glory. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the glory. He's the weight of the glory. We carry him. We carry him. We carry the glory of God. Amen? He says, But we all with open face beholding as in a glass or a mirror the glory of the Lord. We're changed from image into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So this is an ongoing change from glory to glory. We are a house of glory, individually and corporately. God wants His glory to show up. He wants us to get so into the spirit of worship. It'll be like in the old days when the priest could not even stand up to minister because of the glory that came in. There's many times that we've experienced Experience the power of the glory that we could not even move. We were stuck in the glory because the flesh just can't hardly, it can't handle it. And shaking under the glory, paralyzed under the glory. But while you're in that state of being, there's something eternally going on on the inside and the Holy Spirit is moving about and He's piercing and doing things on the inside of people that we don't even know anything about, but He knows. Praise God. It's a spiritual thing. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Praise you, Jesus, from glory to glory. Glory to glory. Hallelujah. And this man, this pastor, has a mandate for such. That's his birthday scripture. That he's building us as a glory house. So God's presence can show up. That's what happened in Pensacola Revival. <laughs> the glory showed up and people from all nations came because they want to be near God. And that's what God is doing. He's pruning and doing everything that He needs to do to bring the glory into this house. Hallelujah. Where the manifestations of the Holy Ghost can operate freely. Glory be to God. Amen? Amen. Stretch your hands toward your giving. Father, we just thank you right now. We, we commit the seed. Lord, we commit these offerings, these tithes to you in the authority of the name of Jesus. Lord, we bind them to your purpose. We bind them to your glory. We thank you, Lord God, for the glory. We thank you, Father God, that miracles are the glory. Ooh, when Jesus lifted up that basket with, or that fish, Lord God, and that bread of that boy, Father, it multiplied exceedingly. And Lord, that was the miracle of your glory. Everything that was wrought in miracles was the glory. Lord, that's what you're talking about, that Jesus is in our midst, and he's still doing what he's always done through his body. Now, Father, we thank you for it. We see this to your purpose and to your kingdom in Jesus name amen glory to God well it's good to see all of you today praise the Lord I hope you had a good week and we're just trusting the Lord for him to do great things in you and through you praise the Lord but we're going to go back and pick up where we have been teaching on what we called Christianity 101 we um had several verses of scripture that we used as a text, Romans chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 6. And I want to just go back real quick just to recap some things that we've said, because this is really vital. This is vital. The reason why the Lord has put this on our heart is because, you know, I was in the construction business for years, and I, I realized that you're never going to build anything that's going to last you're never going to build anything that's going to remain solid 
if you don't get that foundation right. And so these are the foundational principles we've been talking about. And we're going to go back over it again and just uh, hit on a few of the things and then go on from there today. Because today we're going to be talking about the laying on of hands. And there's just some really good things the Lord wants you to get out of this. And we're going to try to hit on that today. But Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. To as many as believe. Amen. And and I, I pointed out that this word unto salvation has two meanings. One is to mean going into and the other is going toward it. And I think this is a very significant part in understanding the basis of our Christian faith is that when we get born again, we enter into the family of God. We become born again and we become a child of God. And that moment when that occurs, salvation has taken place on the inside. We were redeemed from the curse. We're redeemed from sin. We have been purchased, amen, delivered out of the kingdom of darkness and translated over into the kingdom of God's dear son. That's a, that's a fact that happened. It's a present tense reality, amen. But then if you go through the scriptures, especially the letters to the churches, it's over and over and over and over and over again mentioned how we have to go on. We have to grow. We have to mature. We have to take on the character of Christ and be conformed into his image. And that's this word toward because it's an ongoing thing. When you got born again, even though you got all that God had for you. Hallelujah. The Bible says, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. And if you read on down through Ephesians chapter 1, it'll tell you that we've been chosen, we've been predestinated, we've been called, we've been made accepted. All the different things. It's all in the past tense. It's a has tense word that God's already done it. But now this toward is where God wants, to, wants us to go. And Paul made this statement. He said, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And this, this idea of toward, it's the Greek word kata. And we've used this word on many different occasions. Uh, Paul, for some reason, Paul liked this word. Because I've gone through the New Testament and his letters, and, and he used the word kata 200 times. And uh, of those 200, there are several different meanings behind it, and it's referenced to different ways. But one of the, the ones that really got my attention is the word according. That's the Greek word kata, according. He used that almost 80 times. And you can find it here in the book of Ephesians where he talks about according to this, according to this, according to the. He keeps going back to this word according. And the word kata is an interesting word because what it actually means is going to the very depth of something, going as deep as you can go and then reaching as high as you can reach. The word actually means to go from top to bottom. So when we're talking about the Christian faith, I want you to understand that the purpose in our Christian walk every day that we make a decision to do whatever we are to do in God, our purpose is to go as deep as we can in him and to reach as high as we can in him. It's like we, we have this great spectrum from top to bottom that we can't even fathom the limits to. And so, you know, it's an ongoing process. You're, you're never going to get to the bottom and you're never going to get to the top because you're never going to find the depth of God and you're never going to find the height of God. It's beyond our knowledge. The Bible says it passeth knowledge. And, and so you, you have to catch things as you're going up and you have to catch things as you're going down. Amen. I remember something the Lord said to me years ago and I, I wrote it down. I've never forgot it. He said this to me. He said, you will never know the, the height of where love wants to take you yes. 
until you understand the depth that love went to apprehend you. So, so there's, a, there's a work that was deep. We got to go down deep. Amen. And then there was a work that was raised up. Christ went to the farthest place of hell, the bottomless pit, the uttermost part. And then he was raised to the highest place at the right hand of the Father. And we've got to understand both of that. We've got to grasp what he did in the heart of the earth. But we also got to know what he's doing at the right hand of the Father. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And so this is part of the growth process as a Christian. But in order for you to get the full benefit of the top to the bottom, you got to understand the foundation. You got to understand what we're to build on and how we're to build. Amen. And this is so important. I, I found over in the scriptures as I've grew in the Lord that there is a point of transition where we become a child of God. But then there's more to our Christian walk. It's not just being trans transcending out of death into life, but now it's being transformed from life to life. Going from one place to another place to another place. It's like um, in our Christian life, there are different seasons. All of us understand seasons, don't we? Just like there's natural seasons, there's spiritual seasons. Sometimes you're in a, a place where God's dealing with you about a certain thing. Sometimes you're in a place where God's dealing with you with another thing. But and those are seasons. But in every season, there are levels. Yeah. And so we're, we don't want to come out of the season until we've reached the level that God wanted us to reach in that season. Because yeah, if you don't, you're going to go back through the season again. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And, and we don't want to have to repeat things over and over and over again. We want to move on. Yeah. And that's really what Paul's describing here in Hebrews 6 when he said, uh, leaving the principles of the doctrine, let us go on into perfection. Let us go on into maturity. Let us go on into the things that God has already uh, determined for us. And if you read on down a little further, I think, Sam, I don't know if you read verse um, nine there. I think it's verse nine. But he said, the Lord is not, you know, forgetful of your labor of love. Uh, you read that verse, but there was one right above that. It says that there are better things. Yeah that accompany your salvation. There are some better things. And, and that word better, actually the root meaning of that word better is more powerful, more weighty, more advan advantageous to you. If you get a hold of some of the things that God has put in his word, the nuggets we call, they're not necessarily on the surface. You got to dig a little bit. But when you get a hold of some of those nuggets, it's just got so much power to lift you from one level to the next. Amen. And that's really what our Christian life should be. And, and God wants us to do that as, as a practice. The very idea, listen to me, the very idea that we are to live a transformed life means change. If you look at the Greek word metamorpho, it literally means change. It's like the butterfly. It goes into the cocoon. He's being changed inside from a caterpillar to a butterfly. And, and I think it's very interesting if you study that a little bit, that the butterfly is actually completed inside the cocoon. There's no more that needs to be done on the outside of the cocoon. He's everything he needs to be. But now he's got a move until he breaks out of that cocoon. So there's got to be movement. There's got to be change going on on the inside of us. We've got to work our way out of a place that we were to get to a place that God wants to take us. Yeah. Amen. You can't just drift. See, a lot of Christians, they just drift. They're just hoping and praying things will change. But that's why God said the just shall live by faith, because faith is an action word. It means you've got to go take what it is that you have and not just hope that it's going to fall on you, as Brother Hagin would say, ripe cherries off a tree. So this, this whole concept of transformation, this concept of change means that your Christian life can never survive if it's stationary. Because what stationary means is things become stagnant. You know, in order for a river to stay alive, it's got to be moving. 
And quarter, according to your life, you got to keep moving. You got to keep progressing. If you sit back, as we say, on your laurels and do nothing, you are not going to just stay doing nothing. Because stationary means that things begin to stagnate. And when things begin to stagnate, that means death's working. You know, there, there's, a, there's a reality that we as a Christian need to understand is death is a process, just like life is a process. You know, you could sin today and you're not going to die. You're not going to fall over dead. Now, some people have because that's a different type of sin. But in the general sense of the word, you're not going to die. But you open the door to death. The Lord said this to me. I was in Mississippi, pastor in my church in Mississippi, and we resigned and left and went on. And a couple of years later, the Lord had re, you know, told me uh, to go back through there. I thought he was telling me to take the church again. And that was a real struggle for me to think about taking that church again, because I mean, I, I didn't do well there. And so we, we were determined to be obedient to God and we, we came through and stayed with somebody that opened their home for us to stay with them. And I hadn't even really been thinking about the love of God. I mean, I, you know, it's always kind of on your mind and heart, but I mean, it wasn't something that was right in the forefront of my thinking. And I woke up that next morning and I heard this just as if you'd called my name. The Holy Spirit said this to me. When you stop loving, you start dying. And then he said this. He said, one step out of love is one step into death. Now, you know, you're not going to lose love by just making one step out of it. And you're not going to die by taking one step into it. But you begin a process just like it is in our Christian life of maturity. There's got to be a process. You're not going to die. You're not going to become a, a, a mature Christian overnight. It'd be nice if we could just put a you know, magic wand on you and say, now you can, you're everything God wants you to be. But they, we know that doesn't happen. In fact, Paul gave us the whole illustration of growing up spiritually as a baby and then as a child. And then, you know, like we call teenagers that are in between. And then you have an adult, weos, an adult son, somebody that's come to that place of maturity and dignity in their walk, that they're, they're really acting like Jesus. And this is our aim. Amen. And so these are the things that Paul, uh, you know, has, has spent his whole life on building the foundation, building the truths of the scripture, building the church. That's what God told us. Uh, through Jesus in, John, in Matthew 26, he said, on this rock, I will build my church. Building is a process. You don't just do it all in a day. So, you know, when we go back over these principles, and you can look at that in Hebrews chapter 6, he said, leaving the principles of the doctrine, meaning not just abandon them, but, but move on from them. And, and you can't move on to something until you're well established in it. So, so, you know, these are things that we need to get down so that we know them. You know, I mean, Peter even said that we're to, we're to have a reason of the hope that's in us so that we can share that with other people. Amen. I, I've been in a situation before. I just didn't have the answer. Somebody asked me and I just didn't know. I tried my best to work around not knowing and give them some kind of an answer. But it, it, it's it's very frustrating when you don't know how to say what God wants you to say. And, and this is why we need to learn how to grow in the things of God so that when we do speak, we are like an oracle of God. We say what God wants us to say and do what God wants us to do. Amen. And so we've gone through this this foundation and we talked about repentance from dead works. That was the first one. And um, if you didn't get that message, I'd encourage you to go back and I'd really encourage you to go to the next week when Sam opened up and talked about this, about the will, because he brought it up how Jesus was in the garden. And he didn't say, uh, Lord, 
not my mind. Lord, not my emotions. He said, not my will. And, and there's a real challenge on us changing that will. Because that's the governor of the soul. Yeah. Amen. That's the one that's kind of like Scott got the switch that turns you from spirit to flesh or flesh to spirit. It's the will. You've got to have the mind to do it and you've got to have the desire to do it, but you've got to have the will to do it. And that's where things change in our lives. And then we talked about faith toward God. And I, and I gave you this, this definition. I hope you got this. It's an inner conviction that impels you. It's like it thrusts you by a certain inward prerogative that becomes a law of your soul. Something on the inside of you has now become so entrenched inside of you that it's forcing you, it's pushing you, it's thrusting you to hold fast to the Word of God, to hold fast to what God said as the reality in your life. There's a conviction to this that now becomes a law you're not going to violate. I'm not going back to the world. I'm not going back to sin. I'm not going back to the things that I used to do. Because there's a conviction inside of me now, I can't go back. I think I'm far enough into this that if I did go back, I'd probably die. Because there's really no connection to that. And that's really what the scripture means when it says that he's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That calling, if you look that word up, calling, kaleo, it's talking about closing the connection. Closing the connection to that darkness. Exiting it. Coming out of it. And that's really what this is talking about. When we have faith now, we've come out of doubt. We've come out of unbelief. We've come out of wondering. We have established this is the truth and we're going to walk in it. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Yeah. And that's got to be that's got to be rooted in us really, really well, because when trials come, when tests come, when tribulation comes, things come on us that we we don't really know why they came. You know, we can't waver. We can't be like James said, being a double minded man. That's just kind of wishy washy, kind of like one minute we've got our faith in God. And the next minute we've got our hands wringing, wondering how in the world we're going to get out of this. Jesus said, take no thought for your life. There's got to be that solid faith knowing I don't care what it looks like. I'm coming through this. Amen. And then last week we talked about baptisms. And I told you that it's not the word baptism singular, it's baptisms plural. And we gave you the different uses of the word baptisms in the scripture that it, it actually is talking about washing. Washing. That's what the word baptism, baptismos means is to be bathed, to be washed, to be made clean and pure. And there's a there's a washing that goes on inside of us when we get born again. It's called the washing of regeneration. And then there's a washing that we we exemplify in the baptism of water where we we want to represent God by showing that we're willing to go under in order to come up new. And then there's the, the three that I really think are so vital because, see, the, the, the original baptism into Christ, which is when we get born again, and the baptism of water, the, these are initial baptisms you don't, you don't repeat over and over again. You know, once you've been saved, you're saved. Once you've been baptized in water, you don't have to go back and be baptized in water again and again and again and again. There is a washing, but it comes through the Word. Amen. But then these last three here that we talked about, the, the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of fire, and the baptism of suffering, these baptisms are ongoing. They're constant. You're going to have to be filled again and again, over and over again, because it's like your faith is like a muscle in it. And if you don't use it, it's going to shrink up. And, and, and things in the spirit, if you're not building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, then you're going to leak out. I said you're going to leak out. 
That's why he said we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time we let them slip. And that word slip means to drift or to cause to leak out as in a broken vessel. We can let things slip. So we got to refresh ourselves. Amen. David said, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. There's got to be something fresh going on in our lives all the time. And that freshness is through the Holy Ghost. Because he is the oil. And then there's a, the constant fire that God brings us into. Because he's, he's the refiner fire and fuller soap. He's doing things to refine us, to get us where he wants to get us. And there's some things that have to get burnt out of us. Amen. Amen. I'd like to think we could just lay some things down, but some things are a little bit more, more entrenched in us than just laying it aside. Some things have to be burned out of us. And some of us, we don't know what that burning is until we go through some fire. And I don't know about you, but I've been enough fire that I don't think I'd like to go through that again. Amen. But yet there's a process again that's constant. God's burning this up, burning that up. Praise God. You know why? Because he wants to refine us like silver and gold. He wants to get all the dross out of us. And then there's the baptism of suffering, which most of us, we don't like that word. But it has to do with us suffering in the flesh to cease from sin. Now, there are outside sufferings, persecutions, rejection, people, you know, not liking us and, and us going through that part of it. And that was probably a lot of what was going on in the early church because, you know, it was such a, a hardship trying to get the church going. But Christianity has been established for hundreds of years. So it's not like we're a cult and they're trying to snuff us out. But there is a suffering. And you could go in other countries and see where some of them have suffered quite severely for their faith. And maybe we'll have to do some of that here in this country more than we have. But where the real suffering, where this baptism of suffering comes in, is us having to die to ourself. I'm going to tell you something. It takes a lot to you for you to lay something down that's got its hook in you. And if it doesn't get burned out, there's going to be some suffering for you to get it out. Amen. So these are things that we have to understand about baptisms. It's a constant washing. Praise God. And don't you know, it's such a wonderful feeling when you've missed the mark. And you can ask God to forgive you. And he washes and cleanses you from that as if it never existed before. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sin. Amen. And of all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. So today I want to take a few minutes if I can and, and share a little bit on the laying on of hands because this is such an important part of the foundation it seems if you didn't think about it much it would seem kind of odd at least at least to me you know why god made this a fundamental foundational doctrine in the church i can understand repentance that's pretty easy to understand as a foundation having faith toward god that's a pretty easy explanation baptisms obviously even resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, will we, we'll get to next week. The, those, are, those are truths that I think is part of our foundation. We've got to understand something about Jesus is coming again. We've we got to know that we're going to stand accountable for God, before God. Those are truths that we need to get as early as we can get them. But why the laying on of hands? What, what has that got to do with the foundation in the church. Well, that's what we want to talk about today. And if you would, I want you to go to Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5, because this is something that is so important that you see this. I think you all know this, but let's just make sure we got it. In Acts chapter 4, you know the story how that they had threatened the disciples not to speak in that name anymore. 
and how that they went to their own company and reported everything that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And it, and it says down here in verse 29, it says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through or by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Read us again, verse 30, by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Well, over in chapter 5, you know the story of Ananias and Sapphira, and how that they lied against the Holy Ghost and fell dead, and after it says in verse 11, great fear came upon the church and upon as many as heard these things, but look at verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Now their prayer was that, Lord, your hand, your hand heal, and that signs and wonders may be done in the name of your holy child, Jesus. Here it says, and by the hands of the apostles, those signs and wonders were wrought. So this is what you need to understand about the, the reason why laying on a hands is so foundational and why it is so fundamental in our belief system as a Christian is because these are God's hands. God has made it to where we become his instrument. We become his tool. We become his vessel. Amen. In fact, Paul even said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And then if you go over in his Timothy, he tells us that in a house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but of wood and, and earth. And he said, some to honor, some to dishonor. But we're all vessels. And, and being a vessel means that we contain something. And that what we contain is the presence and the Spirit of God. And God wants us to be able to use our hands, our feet, our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our body to express Him because that's what the Bible calls the church, His body. And being His body, we've got to have an understanding that, that this body that I'm in, it may have a person in it, it that's that's human but it's also got something else in it yes. we are the temple of the living god we are the house of god yes. amen yes. and and we got to get a revelation that we are wall to wall holy ghost yes. i mean his he's in my fingers like he's in my hand yes. i mean in my heart he, he's in my eyes just like he's in my heart and all of these instruments that I have are His to use as He desires to use. But now here's the interesting thing about it. Of all the things that God identifies in the body that He wants to use as His instrument, the number one instrument of our body is hands. There's something about hands. And you can go back through the Old Testament and you can find over and over and over again where it talks about the hand of the Lord, how it came upon the, the prophets to, to give a word or to do certain things. I mean, it even talks about in Moses' day how God, his right hand and his outstretched arm brought them out of Egypt. The hand of God did that. And there's all different places. I mean, I, if we could go through them all today, it would just, you know, bless you to, to see it all. You can do that on your own. How that God would use his hand to blind the enemy. How he would use his hand to discomfort the enemy. How he would use his hand to bring judgment on people. The hand of the Lord. Well, here's what you need to understand. The hand of the Lord is a symbol of the Holy Ghost. And the arm of the Lord is a symbol of Jesus Christ. 
If you look at Isaiah chapter 59, it talks about how God looked for an intercessor and couldn't find it. One, and so he said his arm brought salvation. It sustained him. The arm is the Lord. The hand is the Holy Spirit. So the hands do more than your arm. Amen. Your arm's where your strength comes. But it's your hands that do things. Amen. It picks things up. It moves things. It operates your, your body. And so this is why God uses hands to talk about what he wants us to do so that he can move through us. He can use our tongue, obviously. He can use our ears. He can use our eyes. He can use our feet. He can take us where he wants to take us. But when it comes to so much of the things and the operations that go on in, in the church, it's about hands. And isn't it interesting that Jesus went and sat at the right hand of God? It's significant. And you can go back into the Old Testament, and you, especially Jacob, when he was blessing his children, that he would lay his hands on them and confer a blessing on them. Amen. So these are very essential things that we need to know when it comes to the laying on of hands. Now, here's the revelation that we need to get today. The purpose for the laying on of hands was for several things. We'll, we'll get to all of those. But primarily, the laying on of hands was for impartation, for divine intervention. It was to bridge the natural with the spiritual. And it was to further the cause of Christ. I mean, even in the Great Commission, Jesus said, you'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. That's a charge. That's a commission. And it was all for the purpose of getting the gospel to the nations. Amen. And I'll just throw a little extra in here, okay? When we're dealing with the world, he told us we could lay hands on the sick and they'd recover. You, know, you don't have to be a Christian. Listen to me. You don't have to be a Christian for hands to be laid on you to be healed. It's a sign and a wonder for the world to know that God is real. That's the purpose of the evangelist's office and why he carries the power gifts of the working of miracles, the gifts of healings and the working of and the, and the gift of faith, because that's part of the instrumentation to prove the gospel is real. Amen. But, you know, he didn't just say to lay hands on the sick in the church. What he told us to do concerning the church was to anoint them with oil. James said, if there's any sick among you, not the world. And the reason why I believe there's a difference between just laying your hands on somebody and them, you know, being healed as opposed to anointing them with oil is because there needs to be a work of the spirit done on the inside of them, not just to get healed of their physical condition, but healed of whatever caused it. Because the church isn't supposed to be sick. If there is any among you sick, implying that there ought not be. So if there is, there's a cause. Amen? And it may just be our foolishness. We didn't take care of our body like we should have. We didn't do something that we should have done. Maybe the conditions around us that we're not spiritually strong enough to push things off and resist it. But regardless of whatever the cause, it could just be because we're in a sick, sick world with sin in it that sometimes things just kind of get off on us. We didn't realize God on of us. But, you know, if if there's any cause at all, then we call for the elders of the church and we let them anoint us with oil. And the prayer of faith saves the sick and the Lord raises him up. Amen. That was just a little extra. But but the point is, is this the purpose of laying on a hands is something God ordained. And it's for the purpose of impartation for divine intervention, bridging the gap between natural and spiritual, and furthering the cause of Christ. 
This is this is the mission that's on us as a church and why we need to recognize these operations. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to look at a couple of verses here. Uh, I, I wish we could go through all of them. We're not going to be able to do that again. Let me just encourage you to to take what you get today and build on it. Further it in your study. But in Luke chapter four. Verse 38, it says, speaking of Jesus, and he rose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. That's Simon Peter. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever and they besought him for her. And he stood over her. Look at this. He stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she, she arose and ministered unto them. Now, if you look at the account over in Matthew chapter 8, same story here in chapter 8. It says in verse 14, And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And in verse 15 it says, And he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and arose and ministered unto them. I mean, she came right out of that thing. Praise God. A great fever, you're not going to get up and want to minister to people. But when she got her healing... Immediately, she began to minister to the people. Well, that's a miracle. Amen. That's that's a that's a, a sign and a wonder for somebody to be that far off. And then all of a sudden they're up and working. Hallelujah. But but the point is this. He laid his hands on her hand. There was a transfer of anointing. There was something that went into her. Amen. And you can see this here in Luke uh, 4 again, if you go back there to the very next verse in verse 40, it says, Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with divers diseases. I mean, we're just talk talking about, you know, an ailment. We're talking about diseases. There could be anything from leprosy to, you know, all kinds of diseases. It says, And they brought them unto him. And look at this. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Now we have prayer lines sometimes and we go through the prayer line and we lay hands on every single person in the prayer line. Amen. And there are some services I've watched. I mean, Sam came back from a weekend meeting down in Orlando this week. I saw a clip of it on the video. And there was one secret service where they, they laid hands on over 100 people probably. And can you imagine the crowds of people that had come to Jesus? It said that as the sun was setting. I mean, this must have been like, you know, this is a long process. But he kept on doing it. And every person he touched, healing virtue went into them and they were healed. Glory to God. And then you get over into Matthew 16 when the Great Commission and Jesus tells his disciples, he said, do what I did. Preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he that's baptized will be saved. He that's not baptized shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Hallelujah. And one of them was they'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. But see, if we don't really have a revelation of what that means, then sometimes it be like what some preachers say, lay empty hands on empty heads. It's like we don't realize what we have. We don't know how to connect with what we have. We don't know how to release what we have. And then on the other hand, some people don't know how to receive what's been given. There's a way to receive the anointing. Amen. How many of y'all ever been in a conversation with somebody and you're trying to say something and they're talking back at you? It's kind of hard to communicate when somebody's doing all the talking. You just have to basically sit there and wait until they hopefully give you an opportunity to say something. 
And some people like talking so much that they'll never give you that opportunity. Well, you know, in, in the same way that we have means of communicating and saying something and then hearing something, it's giving and receiving. And that same process has to go on when it comes to praying for people. There's got to be a giving and there's got to be receiving. If you're doing all the talking and you're doing all the, you know, claiming what God's done in your life and you're not letting him minister to you, then you're, you're blocking the flow of the anointing. And I've watched this even in one of the areas we're going to talk about is the receiving of the Holy Spirit. How that people can sit there and say, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. And you're sitting there trying to get them to be quiet so that they can listen on the inside and say what the Holy Ghost has given them an utterance to say. But you can't let the Holy Ghost talk if you're doing all the talking. And sometimes you have to instruct people to just say, don't praise the Lord right now. Don't worship the Lord right now. Just listen down on the inside. Hear what the Holy Ghost is saying on the inside and then only say what He has to say. And then the utterance will come. Yeah. And people find themselves getting free and getting, you know, getting filled. But there comes that giving and receiving. Giving, that's a principle. And it comes in every area of our life. Amen? So this is this is how the hands are to be laid on people is that we transmit what God's wanting to transmit. Brother Hagen called it the law of contact and transmission. The contact of my hands will transmit to you what God wants to do. Now, you got to stay full of the spirit. That's part of that baptism of the Holy Ghost. But then you got to have a revelation that these are God's hands. When I lay hands on you, I'm not just laying hands on you. I'm believing for God's hand to be in my hand and his hand lay on you. For there to be a transfer. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. All right. So let's look at these. I'm going to give you six. There's probably a few more that we could probably talk about. These are the main ones where the laying of hands is concerned and why God wanted this to be foundational in the church because every single one of these apply to us being grounded and settled in the things of God. And first of all, we know that God wants us to pray for the sick. I mean, Acts chapter 3 is a beautiful example of how Peter and John, they were just on their way to the temple to pray. And there was a man lame at the gate called Beautiful. Beautiful. And he's looking up, asking for alms. He's not looking to be prayed for for healing. He's needing support because he can't get out and do what everybody else can do to make a living. He, he's on the mercy of the people. And so he's just asking for alms. And there's a quickening. Listen to me. Jesus went into that temple every day for three and a half years. Or not every day, but you know, most every day he went into the temple every, you know, every chance he had for three and a half years. Don't you know if this man had been there for 40 years that Jesus saw him? But then there came that time when the Holy Spirit quickened Peter and John. See, you've got to move in the, in the Holy Ghost. This isn't our, you know, business. This is his business. Amen. It's kingdom business. And you can't make anything happen if he's not in it. So you wait on the anointing. You wait on the presence of God. And then you move with it. And, and Peter, you know, he looked down and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. And he reached out and took him with his hand. And when he did, he lifted him up. And the Spirit of God went through that man. And his ankle bones were made straight and strong. And he got up and walked and leaped and praised God and went into the temple praising God with them. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. See, see and, and you and I have been called, listen to me, we have been called to be those emissaries of the kingdom to where we're, we're to help people come to the realization of who Jesus is. Yes, yes, yes. 
And I can tell you this right now, one of the ways that will get the sinner's attention is when they've got something wrong in their life and you lay your hands on them and the power of God goes in them and just does a miracle for them. Hallelujah. And that's what you see all through the book of Acts. All through the book of Acts. Amen. Paul was preaching there in Iconium and it gotten late. And, you know, he's preaching along and this one man's, you know, he's he just hearing the word and the words going in him. And it says, and Paul perceived that he had faith to be healed. He perceived it. And of course he did. He prayed over that man and that man was healed immediately. Changed the whole course of the ministry in that town. Hallelujah. Amen. So, you know, these are door openers. These are what we call a good advertisement for the kingdom. Hallelujah. When, when we pray for people and they're healed. Number two, another reason why we, we use laying on of hands is it confers people into ministry or sets them apart for ministry. And we could go through many verses, but I'll just look at this one real quick over in Acts chapter 6. Um, the ministration of the widows had gotten so uh, burdensome that the disciples decided that they were going to have to get some help. In verse 3, it said, Brethren, look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this matter or this business. And he said, but we will give ourselves continued to the to prayer, to the ministry of the word. And it's in the saying, please the whole multitude. And they chose and the men there that they mentioned. And notice verse six, it says, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. So in other words, there was there was a uh, an impartation for them to be able to do what God needed them to do. And you can see this in the Old Testament when when the burden became great for Moses. And, and the Lord told me, says, I, I want to take what's on you and transfer it to them. I want there to be a transfer. And it said, and God took some of the spirit that was on Moses and gave it to the elders. So, so there was a transfer of anointing. Amen. And that's a that's a part of this as well. But but in in some cases, it's just a conferring. It's just a sanctioning of the call that's already on somebody. They picked out these men, but I have I can assure you that these men stood out, that there was something stand. I mean, you think about Stephen in the life that Stephen had. There's no doubt that he stood out full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Amen that they could not even resist the wisdom in which he spoke. He wasn't an apostle. He was just a disciple. But, but God chose him because there was something on him, and, and they needed to recognize that publicly. And sometimes that's what the laying hand does, is it sanctions what God's doing in a person's life. Number three, is it, it's a means of blessing. You know, remember when Jesus said the children, you know, came unto him and they they they, they brought the children to Jesus to, to bless them. And the disciples were kind of upset about it and tried to keep them from doing it. And Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me for such is the kingdom of heaven. And, and the Bible says, and he he put them in his lap. He touched them and blessed them. So, so sometimes it's just a matter of blessing. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I don't know about you, but th there's some times when I've just needed God's people just to touch me and just lift my spirit. Amen. I needed to, I needed to be lifted in the spirit. And, and, and through the laying on of hands, sometimes there could be an impartation of blessing. Just to bless, just to, to lift the, uh, the burden off of your shoulder, lift the care that's off your shoulder and be, ref and be refreshed. Hallelujah. Number four is is what Paul describes in Romans chapter one as the importation of spiritual gifts. Now, this is a very interesting, interesting part of the laying on of hands is that God has a desire to impart gifts of the spirit. 
people need to know that there is equipment that they can have for the call and the purpose that God has on their life. And sometimes we just need equipment. We need God to give us the extra equipment. You know, that's one of the things it says in Ephesians chapter four, that for the uh, God gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pap- pastors and teachers. It says in the King James for the perfecting of the saints. But the word perfecting there is equipping yes. for the equipping of the saints. Yes. Yes. And, and sometimes the ministry of the word is part of our equipping. But there can also be a laying on of hands for impartation yes. so that there can be an equipping for people to step into Uh, a greater area of the flow of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I mean, Paul even told Timothy one time, he said, stir up the gift that's in thee through the laying on of my hands. In another place, he says, neglect not the gift that that was given to you through the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So in other words, there was more than just Paul that prayed over him and there was an impartation And and, and so, you know, these are things that we need to recognize in the body of Christ. They're not just, you know, out there and, you know, hope to God we understand this. I mean, there's a lot of churches that don't even practice this. They don't even operate in the laying on of hands. And yet this is so vital. I mean, it's all through the ministry of Jesus. It's all through the book of Acts. It's all through the teachings that Paul gave. And we need to be we need to understand it. In fact, there's one scripture, I think it's 1 Timothy chapter 5, where Paul even told Timothy, he said, lay hands suddenly on no man. Because there's such an impartation sometimes that can come or such a conferring of ministry on some that if their life is not where it needs to be, you're sanctioning something that's going to go awry, that it's going to come back on you. And he said, don't even do that. Make sure that when you, 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 you know, lay hands on somebody for ministry that they're qualified. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's the one that I think we're most accustomed to, probably more than any other. And that is how hands were laid on people to receive the Holy Ghost. And I want you to look at a couple of verses here before we close. Acts chapter 8 Philip had gone down to Samaria to preach the word of Christ. The Bible says that the people in one accord gave heed to the teachings of Philip. And it said, And unclean spirits cried out with loud voices, many that were possessed with them, and many were taken with palsies, and they were lame, that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in the city. Praise God. And it says here in verse 12. It says, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom and the name of Jesus, they were baptized. See, that was what we talked about last week. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, wondering, beholding the miracles and signs which he had done. Verse 14. Now, when the apostles. This is see, this is Philip doing this in Samaria. And it says, and when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid their their they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Through the laying on of hands, there was a transfer of the power of God that they had received in Acts 1 that now had come on them. And that power came through them as they prayed for those men and women to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Somebody said, well, yeah, you know that that's that's the problem that we have today is that it all ended with the apostles. See, Philip couldn't preach, couldn't lay hands on them to receive the Holy Ghost. He wasn't an apostle. They had to get John and Peter to do it. And I've heard that argument all through my life. 
until you take them over to Acts chapter 9 when Paul had an experience with God on the road to Damascus. The light was so bright it struck down his sight. Scales came on his eyes. And he had to be led into the city. And God told him that there was a man that his name was Ananias to seek him out and he'd pray for you. Well, if you read that scripture, it doesn't say Ananias was an apostle. It said he was just a disciple. But when he laid hands on Paul, it was to heal him of that blindness and to get him filled with the Holy Ghost. So a lay person, as we would call them, a disciple who wasn't one of the twelve, used hands yes. to bring Paul into a further experience with God through the Holy Ghost. Yes. Hallelujah. So, you know, that's just scriptural right there that, you know, any one of us can pray for somebody to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You don't have to be in the fivefold ministry to do that. God wants to use every one of us to be an instrument of his hands. Amen. And then over in Acts chapter 19, if you look over there, we have this great account of Paul coming through the coast of Ephesus and finding certain disciples. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, What then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. And Paul said, John barely baptized with water unto repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him that should come. That is Jesus Christ. He said, but listen, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, they got born again. They hadn't even heard whether there was a Holy Ghost. So if they hadn't heard whether there's a Holy Ghost, they hadn't gotten saved yet because that's who baptizes you into the body. But then it said this, look at this. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them. And they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12. Glory to God. Whoo! A little revival right there on the way to Ephesus. 12 men filled with the Holy Ghost. One minute they didn't even know there was one. The next minute they're speaking in tongues and prophesying. How did all of that happen? Hands. Something happened through the transfer of what was in Paul into them. And they were filled. God honored that. I said God honored that. And then later on in this same chapter, it says in verse 11, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. Man, you talk about miraculous. I mean, you think about it. I mean, I could understand how special miracles could take place with the contact of those hands being laid on people where there's an immediate transfer from one hand into that body. But to think about that power going into a cloth and then that cloth being taken away from the person who laid their hands on those claws and put it on a body that had been ill or had been, you know, pl plagued with demons. And suddenly the power of God comes out of the cloth. Yep. Yep. Man, if we understood the power that's in these hands yes. and what God wants to use with these hands, if we would just begin to think about, Lord, you want to use these hands. You want these to be your hands. When I lay hands on somebody, I'm going to believe God for that law of contact and transmission to take effect and for things to go out of me. Don't do it lightly. Don't do it irreverently. Do it with honor, respect, and, and do it with, with faith. Release your faith when you pray for somebody. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. These, these are things that God wants to do. And, and we've got to understand this is, this is fundamental. This is fundamental. Every single one of you in here 
don't need to be shy and afraid. Use it. Use the gifts. I, I've gone into situations before where somebody will be laying in a bed and they're unconscious and I still want to touch them. Just want to get my hands on them. Hallelujah. I've had situations where somebody didn't want me praying for them. And I just shook their hand. And I said, I'm going to use my faith. That this handshake is going to bring something about in their life. I've heard of mothers that had wayward kids that they've anointed claws and put them under their pillow. Hallelujah. Discomfort those spirits. Discomfort the devil. Hallelujah. They all of a sudden don't want to sleep in that bed anymore. I wonder why. God has ways and he wants to use us. We are his instruments. We are his body. And I want you just, if you would, just to close your eyes for just a moment and put your hands out in front of you. And I want you just with, with just in your heart, I want you to think about it. These are God's hands. These are God's hands. And he can work through me just like he worked through Paul or Peter or John or even Jesus because he lives in me. I'm his vessel. I'm his temple. And there is a power that God wants to generate on the inside of us. What we th talked about last week is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Where we can become so charged that we are like electric rods. That as soon as we come in contact with people that have a need, demons will know it, sickness will know it, sin will know it. As we lay our hands and see the devil doesn't want this. I'm telling you, the devil is doing everything he can to upset the flow of God in our lives. He wants us attached to the world. He wants us hungering after things of the world. He wants to defuse the power. He wants to re render it re ineffective. So that when we do lay hands on people, there's not anything that happens. But if we'll consecrate ourselves and trust God that he lives in us and we give him that honor and the glory of being our Lord and Savior. And we say, Lord, use these hands for your glory. Use these hands for your glory. Lord, it's not me. I can't heal a gnat's wing. I, I can't I can't reverse a curse. I can't make a. A, a demon leave on my own that's not me I don't have that ability but I know that it's I'm your instrument that you can flow through me and that you can bring healing and deliverance and blessing to those in, in the body of Christ hallelujah now, now, now Christian I want you to come up here I want you to stand right up here in the front here for just a moment Because probably two years ago, I knew the Holy Ghost told me to tell you that there was a ministry of laying on of hands in your life. Now, some people have a different anointing. Some people are called to be an apostle. Some people are called to be a, a prophet, evangelist, a pastor, a teacher. Some people have the gift of tongues and interpretation. Some people have a different gift. But there is a ministry of laying on hands. We, we've seen people that had that anointing on them that they had a special anointing to heal cancer. They had a special anointing to heal deafness. They had a special anointing to heal certain uh, various diseases. I knew when I prayed over you a couple years ago that the Holy Ghost on the inside told me that he had anointing on your life for the ministry of laying on hands. 
And I'm telling you, under the unction of the Holy Ghost, that the devil has worked hard to keep you down spiritually because he sees what you can't see right now. He knows what you don't know right now. And that is, he sees what you're calling and anointing is for the body of Christ and for those that you touch in the world where you can bring change. So he wants to continually press down on you to hold down that calling. And rightly, when we don't do like we should or we're struggling or we're distracted, then we lose the confidence that we need when we lay hands on somebody that God's going to use us. And, and, and I'm going to give you a word right now. When we're talking about these fundamental things, Paul addressed the church of, 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 of the Hebrew Christians and he said that we needed to become skillful in the word of righteousness. Well, righteousness is our position. Righteousness is who we are. We have been made the righteousness of God in Him. And that's where our confidence and assurance comes from. That's where we know that we know. Because we're not doing this in us, we're doing this in Him. And because we have a right conscience, we have a right mind, we have a right thought pattern, our will is right. Everything on the inside is right. There's a boldness that comes with that righteousness. And the devil has done everything he could. Listen to me. He's done everything he could to rob you of that confidence. And I'm here to tell you today that we're pulling you up out of that. This body is going to believe together for the ministry of the laying on of hands to be on you with such power that when there is a need, we're going to say, Christian, come. Lay your hands on this one. Lay your hands on that one. And we're going to watch God move miraculously. Do you want that? Do you want that? Now, I'm, 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 I'm not wanting you to tell me this with your head. I want you to tell me with, this, with your heart. Do you want to walk in the call where you have the ministry of laying on a hands where you start to see miracles and signs and wonders and people getting set free? Yes. You want to see that? Yes. Sam, come over here. Hallelujah. Now, there's a, there's a, respe a respect and an, an authority that he carries that you honor and you respect. And he and I are going to lay hands on you. So this is a double whammy. Because there's something that needs to get broke. I said there's something that needs to get broke. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. We're going to fight yes. for you. Yes. 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 I am not going to let the devil have your gift. I'm not going to let it. Come on. Come on, y'all stretch your hands out toward him. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, we thank you for our brother. We thank you for the call that's on his life. Satan! Take your hands off of God's property. Take your hands off of God's property. Take your hands off of God's property right now in the name of Jesus. From the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Holy Ghost, come back in charge of this vessel. Take your rightful place and rule in the midst of his enemies right now in the name of Jesus. 
And Father, I thank you for boldness. I thank you for confidence. I thank you for assurance. I thank you for everything that he needs to equip himself for what you've called him to, that he'll step into it with ease. That, Lord, this will not be a battle. This will not be a raging war. That, Father, there'll be something down on the inside, a resolve, a resolve deep down in his spirit that he's going to take a hold of what he's been called to and he's going to walk it out in the name of Jesus. And he'll have such determination and conviction about this that, Lord, there'll be a fear that falls on him to step away from where he's supposed to be and what he's supposed to be doing. That, Lord God, that he will shun it like a plague. He'll shun it like a plague. That he will not even get near it. That, Lord God, you'll bring him out like you brought the children of Israel. And you'll close the waters on the enemy that's tried to bite on his heels. In the name of Jesus. Right now, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for freedom. Freedom. Freedom, 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 freedom in the name of freedom. Hallelujah. Come on, stretch your faith out, brother Christian. Stretch your faith out and say, it's mine. I have it now in the name of Jesus. Say your faith. Declare it right now. I will walk in my calling. I will walk in this ministry. These hands are his hands. And these Lord, the Lord will use me mightily. I am ready. I am ready to step into it in Jesus mighty name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory to God.